¿Qué tal amigos? Eh, nos habéis echado de menos, nosotros a vosotros sí. Eh, ha pasado un poquito de tiempo desde el último vídeo que grabamos, pero seguimos teniendo ideas, seguimos teniendo programas y seguimos teniendo invitados y muchas ganas de, de hablar de muchas cosas. Pero antes de presentar a nuestro invitado de hoy, quería anunciaros una pequeña buena noticia que seguro que a todos los aficionados al ciclismo os va a gustar, porque dentro de solo 11 días ya va a haber ciclismo de competición y a más de buen nivel, porque los campeonatos nacionales de Eslovenia se van a disputar el 21 de junio. Allí con un recorrido duro, con final en alto, van a estar Tadej Pogacar, va a estar el primo Roglic, así que va a ser muy interesante. Así que os dejamos esa buena noticia para... Para, bueno, para animarnos todos un poco y pasamos a presentar a, a, nuestro, a nuestro invitado de hoy. La entrevista la vamos a hacer en inglés, aunque él se defiende también en español, pero para entendernos todos mejor vamos a hacer esta entrevista en inglés con subtítulos. Tenemos con nosotros al que fuera ciclista en su día, ganador de etapas en el Tour de Francia, ganador de etapas en el Giro de Italia, medallista olímpico y hoy en día uno de los directores deportivos de, del equipo Movistar, Maximilian Siandri. Nice to have you. Thanks for being with us and how are you? Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. No, well, I'm, I'm good. Good. I'm home and... Uh... And uh, I'm kind of ready. I've been ready for the last uh, three months now, waiting for, waiting for the season to start again and, uh, and hopefully actually starting in Italy, right uh, close by my house with Strade Bianche. So just looking forward to get going again. A very, very strange period of everybody's life, I think. You know, something totally different happened. So we'll see. Yeah, I think it's pretty much the same for everyone. We are all looking forward so much. To, to watching and to having cycling and to, to, to start the cycling season again. But mm -hmm. before that, before talking about uh, the, the, the present and the future, uh, I, I was saying that uh, you won stages in the Giro, in the Tour, in the, you won a bronze medal in the Olympic Games also in 1996. Yes. So just to, to, to have uh, something to start with, Which is your best uh, memory in cycling from your years as a professional cyclist? Well, um, I had a pretty long career. I started uh, Turn Pro in 1989 uh, with a small team and uh, I raced for more or less 17 years. So it was a pretty long career. Uh, you know, I think probably the best memory uh, is always the first victory you have in the pro cycling. And it was my first year professional in 1989 and I won. Uh, Giro di Romagna and uh, second was Saroni, Bontempi, Rosal, all the big names who were coming out of the 80s into the early 90s. And, uh, and that was my first year pro and I won that race. And I think it's, it's still a very beautiful and clear memory. And, you know, it's the first win, what said, you know, and then you say to yourself, okay, I can, I can be a good pro. So I'd say the first victory was one of my best memories. Uh, and then obviously, you know, stages here and there and the Olympic medal uh, were incredible moments. But right up there, I just don't want to jump too much ahead in the interview, but also the, the, the Giro win last year with the movie star was a great experience, great memory. Yeah. Uh, I have a specific question about one of your best results as cyclist. When you got the bronze medal in, uh, in Atlanta in 1996, mm -hmm. I remember uh, in the post-race interview, you said that you didn't have any chance to, to beat uh, Pascal Richard, who was uh, the one who got the, the gold medal. And that's something that I, I found a bit strange, but I that, still remember those words. That's incredible. That you, 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 you were that. a very fast rider, and I thought you were no, the favorite I, to win. But yeah, I was why did favorite. you say that? I tell you what happened that day. Basically, there was an earlier break of uh, four riders with uh, Frank Andreo and a Spanish guy. I think uh, uh, he won the Vuelta. I can't remember his Mauri, name. Mauri, maybe? Uh, Mauri? I think Metro Mauri. Literally four guys in a breakaway. The course was really, really fast and it was really humid and hot. And I was out in the breakaway pretty early. When the field quarters, I slipped again away and I went with Rolf and Pascal. And normally, exactly as you said, 
I was a faster guy than these two, especially on a, on a slightly up hill, I could have beat them. But because I, I, I was already in the breakaway for two or three laps before, straight away into the breakaway again, the last lap I was literally on my knees. And I did a little attack around four or 500 meters going into the finish line just to see if I could maybe anticipate, but I was dead. So that was strange that you remember that. And, and, uh, and usually I was faster than these guys. I mean, you know, every race has a different story and every race is different. But on, on a one-to-one, I could beat these guys. But that day, I, was, I, was, I, was, I, I spent all my money earlier on in the race. And the last lap, I was, I was completely dead. It was a very hot day, I remember, and very humid and, and a very fast race, actually. That's the story behind, <laughs> maybe behind that interview. <laughs> Max, good afternoon. Um, hey. uh, one, one of the things we like to do in this program is um, to present the, the, the person behind the sportsman um, to, our, uh, mm-hmm. to our viewers. And one of the things that uh, some people might not know is that you're actually a British citizen instead of Italian because you changed nationality because of the Olympic Games, because you wanted to go yeah. to the Olympic Games. You were born in Derby in, uh, in the United exactly. Kingdom. So I would like you to, to explain us a little bit a part of if there's any other reason why you cho- uh, you switch nationalities a part of the Olympic Games. Uh, no, it wasn't actually for the Olympic Games. It was basically, uh, as you said, I have dual nationality. So I'm born in England and then lived a lot of my life in Italy. Uh, so I have two passports. <clears throat> When I turned pro, I turned pro with an Italian license. And I had Italian license for the first around three years. But then when I when in Italy in the early 90s, <coughs> excuse me, uh, when you race for a foreign team, and at that time I was winning quite a bit, six, seven, eight races a year, and I was racing with Motorola, the Italian coach, Alfredo Martini, didn't like that. And for some reason he never picked me for the for the for the for the for the for the, for the team, for the national team. So at the time, you had a chance to just pick up a, di- a British license as to a citizenship. So I picked up a British license. And then from there on, I did all the world championships and Olympics for, for Great Britain. That's how it happened, really. Um, it was just because I wanted to do the world. And I think I deserved it because I was, I was winning a lot. And I was, you know, I was a pretty good rider in the days. That's, that's the reason behind the, the, the license, the British license. And road, uh, road cycling wasn't as big as it is now in England back in those days. Uh, you've seen quite a lot of that change happening in the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Exactly. Uh, did did yeah, you exactly. not expect that something like this could happen in, in this short period of time? Well, I didn't expect it so big. But um, when I started my career in 2004, uh, I met Dave Browsford, what is the team principal of uh, Ineos right now. And he was the head of performance program in British Cycling. And uh, British Cycling had a performance program at the time. And, uh, and I started, I jumped into British Cycling. And I said to Dave Brasford, I said, Dave, uh, they're investing a lot on the track. And that's where they're gaining all the medals in the, in, in the, around the year 2000 and, and down that area. And, and I said, Dave, you're not going to only have track riders. You need, you're going to have road riders. But to have road riders, we need to have a program. So that's when I started around 2005 and I had the development program of British Cycling. And we had all the guys who were actually winning the Tour de France now were all living here in, in Quarata, just outside Florence where I live. And we had an academy house. We had a house. We had staff. And, and we developed and I developed in a way this uh, road cycling program. So... But I didn't think it was going to become so big. I mean, it, you know, you obviously hope, but then you have Froome was living here, Thomas, uh, Stannard, Ben Swift, you know, Cavendish, all these guys were in this area. And we slowly, slowly developed the program. And then, then you know, the program then grew and then, then and Sky came aboard and then the program stopped. And so a lot of things happened. But basically, we gave the chance of all these British riders to, to express themselves on the road and, and, and become who they are right now. So, but to say that they won with Froome and, and Thomas and the whole lot and Cavendish winning more than 30 stages, I would never thought they would become so good. You know, you always <laughs> hope that you can pull out some good riders, but to this extent, no. 
I think this is very, very interesting, but because most of people might not know that you were part of that early stages of, uh, of British cycling development in, um, in road races. I, I sorry, I don't no, want to start. Yeah, go ahead. I, I only wanted to ask you because you, now you know quite good English, British cycling, uh, you know, Spanish cycling, of course, and Italian cycling. Do you think that traditional countries like Spain or Italy, or maybe Belgium or France or whatever it is, um, could start some kind of program now to come back and, and, and take those, those years back? Or, or, or are we on a different level, on a different culture of, of cycling? Well, for sure, it is a different level. It's a different culture. That's for sure. I mean, you just said Spain, Belgium, Italy, it's France. It's all about how we did it and culture. This is how we did it. This is how we do things, you know. All the English side speaking part of the world, uh, Australia, America, England, they, had, they didn't have that tradition. So they could say, this is how we want to do it. So they don't rely on how we did it. This is how we do it. And that's a little bit the difference between these two points of view and two philosophies. You know? So British cycling, they had the know-how. I mean, they had the money because the, the lottery used to put money into different sports and they put a, quite a bit of money into cycling because they're winning Olympic medals on the track. So we just had to develop a program what gave the possibility to riders to express themselves and, and then become who they became. So to say that Italy needs, uh, I kind of, it was funny because then I was technical commissaire of the British cycling team. And then when everything finished, I went to, into BMC. And this was around after six years of British cycling. I went to BMC, the professional team. And then Italy called me and, and they wanted to do something. With, and I said, let's go back and let's start again on the track. Let's dismantle these amateur teams in Italy, what win 50, 60 races per year, per team, but don't really mean nothing. I used to win with British cycling three to four races a year, stop. But all the riders, what, what I had, everyone's been a successful rider, everyone. You know, and a lot of these Italian teams, they win on the day, but then they don't produce riders, you know. So there is things that can be changed. Some nations maybe sometimes have to look at going back to simplicity and on the track and, and cyclocross, you know. Just look at these guys now. The new guys are coming out of different disciplines. So there is always something to do. There is always something to do to try and make people better, that's for sure. Do you think this situation now, this, this complete stop in, uh, we are living now in, in cycling, could be an opportunity for, for those countries like Spain, like Italy, as you mentioned, to rethink all those strategies and, and, and just start over again? Because I, I guess that that's what you are saying that we need. Start over and, and forget about this is how we have done it for centuries. I mean, not for centuries, but at least for one century and, and, and jump straight ahead in the 21st century. Well, for sure. I mean, national, national, uh, national teams or, or every nation has to look at, I think it comes down then to, okay, win, cycling is winning grand tours and winning races, but then it's the Olympics and Olympics are coming down to winning medals, you know, so medals are on, on the track. In the velodrome, there's a lot of medals to be won, you know, quite a few. So it, it just depends. I think if, if you, just, you just allow a cyclist, a young cyclist, to do different disciplines, as in cyclocross and track and whatever you want, BMX, it just makes them better some way. You know, it's just not road, 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 road. You know, even this, uh, you know, during the lockdown, people have got on the, on the, on the turbo trainers and, and, and started to do virtual races, okay, it could have been, they're okay, but everybody wants to see real racing. But I'm just saying that, that you have to explore, you know, and not only say, this is how we did it. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's always a good chance to look at different ways of doing things, you know, and trying to grow. Why not? Well, that's quite a background and experience that you have. And you have telling us a little bit about it, which is always very handy <laughs> to be the, the director of, of a team now. But I would like to know uh, if uh, how your experience also as a rider 
has helped you as a, as a director? Because I remember you were a fast rider. You, you could win in, in a sprint, at least in a small group. But you were quite a tactician also. You were a rider who tried to find the right move and be there and, and win from, from a breakaway or something like that. Uh, also, thanks to your sprint. But you didn't rely on your sprint. So, uh, mm -hmm. do you think that a former rider that who is now a director needs to uh, or, or or has had to be a good tactician back in the day to be now a good director? No, 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 absolutely not. I think uh, one of my qualities, and I don't want me to say it, I'd like other people to say it, is is just to really one of. First of all, when I when I when I have a team and I'm at a race, I, I listen. I listen. That's my first. My my priority is to listen. I want to see who I have, who are the riders, what race are we doing, what they expect from themselves, and and, and then what I try and do is I just try and assemble, and and, and push the team forward. You know, so I, I'm in a way I'm very good at listening. I like to listen to riders, and 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 and, and they can tell you everything. They tell you where they're scared what they don't like to do, what they would love to do, but they, they can't do it. So that's what, that's the areas where I try and explore. And, um, and obviously being a rider helps you. That's for sure. You know, uh, we're talking about cycling. So, you know, having done all these years and just being fresh, uh, I still have Taylor Finney, what, you know, didn't really become what, who he, everybody expected him. And he sends me a message and says, Hey, I miss you. I'd like to spend some time with you. So I try and be fresh, young, and, and, and realistic with people, you know, and just trying to assemble a good team. And again, I say being a rider always helps because it just gives you that fine tuning of understanding what's happening, you know. So I don't come in as a director and, and, and say, this is what I want. It'll, it'll come down to a day where you say that, obviously, because you have to make a decision. But it's assembling people and, and, and just trying to pull the best out of them to have to achieve a goal that's that's how i work you know it's it's pretty it's a pretty simple way actually when when you were still a, a rider who did you learn the most from i mean a, a director that you had back in the day would you mention well, one no for sure ferretti yeah everybody yeah. can say that you know it's been it's a bit like the manolo science of the day and and uh, giancarlo ferretti was a very uh, demanding sport director, what could really pull the best out of you, and he would he would give you the odd shout when you needed it, and and that's a good thing because every now and then a rider needs to be pushed at, you know, a little bit, and and uh, he was a guy who gave me a lot. You know, I, I didn't unfortunately give him back, and I think I, if I look at my career, I never like to talk to, about my career because I think I could have won maybe more. I'm pretty happy with what I did, but I think with Ferretti. He is a great guy where you could le I learned a lot. Coming um, on your uh, Movistar um, years since 2019 uh, and listening what you have said about British cycling just before, in this 2020 season, all the reconstruction that we've seen in Movistar, which is one of the oldest teams in the, in the World Tour uh, peloton, is it, uh, is it maybe your hand moving things and trying to um, make a younger team and, and bringing up new talent and, and, and taking, taking things a step forward, as I said before, to the 21st century, or not? Uh, no, I think, uh, I think, personally, I think it, when Eusebio took me aboard last year, I think he opened the door to a small change in the team in terms of letting an Anglo Italian, whatever you want to call me, I think it is hard to look at a little bit of a change. The team was been around for 40 years. It's a team that won almost everything. It's a team that it's a fantastic team. In a way, it's a family. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's made around tradition and stuff. But I think Eusebio may be letting me in. He just wants to start a slow change. And a slow change is not about 
drastically changing everything. It's just like exploring different areas. And, you know, this year when we were at the training camp, at the beginning of the season, we had a few meetings, I mean, by sponsors, presentations in English. And I went up to Zebio while they were presenting, let's say, Zram, one of our sponsors. And I said, hey, Zebio, would you have never dreamed of having a presentation in English in your team? And he had a little laugh, you know. And I think it's just... It's just recognizing that there is other people out there and, and other sponsors and, and uh, how they left Campagnolo. They went on to, to Zram, I, I, I an example. And, and, and I, I would never want to see him change the team. I think I love this team and I love how he actually, he run this two months of a coronavirus lockdown, you know, the way he, he founded tranquility and, and stay, you know, just like, okay, we'll get over this. And, something good would come out of it. So I think this team doesn't really have to change. It has to just maybe explore a little bit and, and, and open little doors to, to, to smaller changes. But I wouldn't want to see becoming an Enos or, or a Bora or, or an ex-BMC. No, that's for sure. I would want, want to see that happen. But I think maybe a small change will happen. What is the thing that shocked you the most when you changed from, uh, from a structure like BMC and you arrived in Movistar? Well, uh, BMC relied a lot, a lot on communication. You know, emails were flying around like flies <laughs> in a hot summer day. <laughs> so boom, 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 all it was about emails all day long. And this team had this silent structure. What, what was, things would just fall into place with nothing. Not even a phone call, just like one, uh, one email and, and it was like a domino doo, 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 and everything will go into place. And I was amazed how, and I, and I just said to myself, this is because of people being here years and years and years and just knowing exactly what to do. So that was amazing, you know, and how we had to sit and plan for hours, hours in, in, in BMC. And I think a lot of time was just literally wasted because it wasn't about more you put emails together and the more writing you put, the better things happen. Everybody will just sit at the table and win a Tour de France at the table. But it's just like how much time we spent doing that and how much time we didn't spend in movie star and things happened and we won the Giro, let's say, last year. So that was something that really amazed me, you know? Just the, 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 the depthness of the people, the staff he has, and we have, I'm, I'm here right now, and, and how good they are, you know, how professional and good quality we have. And things just really went smoothly. That's something really shocked me last year when I came aboard. I think, and, and now we, we will talk about the Giro d'Italia of last year, because I know Saul is excited to speak about that. But um, some years ago, back in, in Denia, in a BMC uh, winter camp, I, I asked uh, Bentoso, who was he who just had completed his first year with you guys at BMC, which was the main difference he found between Movistar and BMC. And, BMC. and, he, and he said something like that uh, there in BMC, everything was planned. He knew back in December which races he was going to race and, and, and that yeah. was, wasn't moved at all. While in Movistar, it was more like uh, Eusebio playing chess with the riders and sometimes uh, receiving a phone call in the morning saying that your plan doesn't exist anymore, you're changing that. Maybe, I don't know, I'm asking you, that's the, the difference between a Latin approach to, uh, to planning and a more uh, Anglo-Saxon approach to, approach to cycling. I don't know which one you like the most and which, which one gives the better results. No, well, I, I, you know... Uh... I think last year we did exactly the, the same as Ventoso said they do in Movistar was we assembled the team at the last moment and we went and we won the Giro. So which is the best? I don't want to say which is the best. I just want to say I do what I do here in Movistar right now. And, and Ventoso said it. BMC was all about planning, 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 planning and, and emails all the time. So two different ways of, of, of approaching a season and, and assembling a team. But which would be the most productive, I can't really say. But somehow, from what you have been explaining about Movistar, I get the impression that it's a very relaxed atmosphere in the team. But uh, maybe I'm wrong, but could be maybe too relaxed, like not having that, uh, those plans uh, could lead to some, um, 
a bit of no, uh, lack of... Uh, no, lack I don't think fighting. so, because, uh, I mean, here in this team, you have, a, you have a, an incredible leader like Alejandro Valverde, what he doesn't really need to plan. You know, he just, he, when he goes to races, people know exactly what they need to do and, and when they need to do it. You know, he's, he's a guy who has a team and such a big experience, what's... What you know, you don't need to plan stuff. You don't need to write stuff. You just go to the bike race with a team and and you do it. I think the the, the slow change, especially even with Pachi Villa this year, would probably be a little bit of planning. Why not? I mean, a little bit of uh, programming and and stuff like that. But it's something what what needs to happen slowly, it needs to happen by time, and 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 maybe you know the I think maybe movie star will, will slowly change their their point of view of stuff, but. It's all stuff what was going to happen slowly. I can't really say I'm just, I'm just one. I'm just one of a whole organization. So it's going to take time. One of the things that uh, was talked the most about uh, last year was the, the, the approach that Movistar team had in the Giro d'Italia, a very successful approach, by the way, because you won the race. But uh, we, we saw a team that was quite uh, more aggressive and uh, maybe adventurous than, than usually or than, than in the past. Movistar is generally seen as a very conservative team, conservative. but in, in the Giro, uh, you were really, really aggressive and, and it, uh, it really paid off. Do you see yourself as uh, responsible for that or did you try to have a very, let's say, a, a fresher approach in that race? Well, you know, first of all, I don't want to say it was my, this is somebody else has to say it, the, you guys, the journalists and people around the team. I don't want to, I don't want to say it was me or, or Chente, we were the two guys at the Giro. But for sure, if you look at the Giro, we came into the, into the time trial of San Marino. And we had both of us, in terms of uh, Carapaz and Landa, they both had around eight minutes to, 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 to make. We had eight minutes behind. So... In one way or the other, it wasn't just waiting and love the leaders drop. It was us. We needed to catch time. So the only way to do that was just to stop throwing them ahead and starting to, to gain time back, you know. And, and I just, all I said always was just like, let's take advantage of uh, the Rodic Nibali was created by the media. Nobody's looking at us. Oh, let's just go. So I said, let's take advantage that they don't even, I know, I just opened every day the Gazeta, just have a little look and see. And our name was nowhere, really. Just little here, a little there, you know, a little land attacks, and makes a few minutes back. So I knew that there wasn't really, nobody was looking at us, but we had time to make back. So we said, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And that's, that's maybe one little step of the whole, you know, comp, you know the whole structure of how we, we won the Giro then slowly, slowly, slowly. But that's how we had to do it. I don't know, it's up to you guys to say <laughs> whatever happened, but that's what happened. Yeah, well, personally, I really had that impression. I mean, I know it's something that uh, I'm, I'm not the only one who, who got that, that impression that Movistar was somehow a more aggressive team than, than usual, which, by the way, was great for, uh, for, for the show also because it was mm -hmm. such a great race. But also, uh, I'm very curious about uh, how did it work with two leaders, because you had uh, Mikel Landa, you had Mikel Carapaz. Uh, on paper, Landa was the, the leader at the beginning of the Giro, or maybe at least for, for us, uh, seeing yeah, it from... Yeah, sure. I, I'm just going to move, outside. because I'm, I'm outside and it's starting to rain. I'm just going to go on oh, a yeah. little shelter here. Yeah, no, so, no um, problem. But how, how, how was that, to, to work with two leaders that uh, eventually had to change the roles? It during was, the race? It was, um, I think the best of was really, obviously, a guy like Landa to accept, to give the Shetro, I don't know how you can say in Italian, in English, sorry, but, you know, he, 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 one moment he yeah, accepted but to say... But it's the same word in Spanish, so... Shetro, no okay. Yeah. So, in order that, to that to happen, first of all, you needed a, a really honest guy and that's Landa, Mikel Landa, really honest guy who well, at one point said okay he is the strongest and how did that transition happen? It happened slowly, it happened on the road and again one of the key points was uh, the San Marino time trial where I actually 
follow the Richard. And uh, the difference between the two was pretty obvious, you know. And that was in a time trial like that. This really tells you what's happening, you know. I mean, it's it's this is it's like you against the time. So I think it was, it was a slow transition to the point where it, exactly then Landa accepted that the Richard was the leader, and uh, and we just made it happen. We had to make that happen slowly, slowly during the race. Uh, Max, you just said now that uh, Mikkel is, uh, was uh, very, um, very kindful from his part to, um, to give the Fedra, as you said, to, uh, to Carapath. But do you think he's... Because there's two, two kinds of, of people now in cycling. The ones who think that Mikkel is overrated and the ones who think that Mikkel is underrated. In which, in which part are you, um, are you, are you now? No, I, I think he has an incredible potential to be, over, uh, to be one of the guys. Obviously, he hasn't really, you know, he lacks a little bit of, obviously, results. I mean, top results. I'm talking about podiums and grand tours or winning grand tours. Personally, I think he has the engine. I, he has the engine in terms of he has the capability, the capability of winning. Uh, I just think sometimes he lacks a little bit of... Um, can you say balls, you know, just to say, let's go, you know, let's do it. Let's, I don't want to think about nothing. If, if, I, if I fuck up, sorry, my English, it's okay. But that's what I wanted to see from him. And it's funny because I went in the room so many times after the race and I said, Mikkel, every time I, I, I'm on the internet and this, oh, on the paper and there's a photo of you, I, I want to see you suffer. I want to see your face, like, dig in. That's where you put out the best. And... Sometimes he just lacks that part of it, you know. He just lacks that that final ten percent to really make the difference, or one percent, or whatever you want to call it. So, I still think he has. He can. I still think he can win again. I mean, even right now with a new team. But if he's going to do it or not, I don't know. In the documentary we, we we've seen uh, this year. Going back mm -hmm. to Movistar and last year, we saw Mikkel um, after one stage. I can't remember what happened on that stage now, but he was saying like, "Now uh, I'm gonna feed the, the social media and the newspapers are gonna talk. Let's see what they say now." Do you think that that ten percent, that lack of balls, as you said, might come because of riders now? Some some of them, may, maybe Mikkel included, but also others, are. Uh, are afraid of what's going to be said about them on, on social media and on traditional media because nowadays everyone has a telephone and an opinion. No, exactly, exactly. Yeah, as you said, everybody has quick access to, right after the race, quick access to, you know, when, in my days you just had to wait till the day after, open the paper and then, you know, there's a few papers here and there and, and that was it. Now it's just like immediate, you know, immediate uh, as, they, as they drive back to the hotel in the bus or in the car, they can they have access to media and what they're saying and what they're not saying and photos. Uh, if he's afraid of that, I don't really know. I know yeah, he's a super intelligent guy. I really like, uh, I really like him. It was, it was fantastic to have him in the team. I think the success of Richard was because we had a guy like Mikkel. Because uh, he actually helped uh, understand other riders and, 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 and guided us as DSers and his teammates. To, to success um, if he's afraid of, of the media side of himself I don't really know it's, I don't know him that well to say I haven't spent a couple of years or three years with him to say and uh, what he's afraid of and what he's not afraid of you know I'm, I'm not at that point um, I was really upset that uh, he had to leave uh, he left I would have really liked to spend some more time with him that's for sure uh, a bit more about that Giro. Uh, of course, uh, the team won the, won the Giro with Richard Carapaz, and you've been saying that uh, also it was great to see a leader on paper like Mikel Landa also working for uh, Richard in that Giro. So mm -hmm. I think the, the, the team did a really great job uh, backing him to, to win the race. So because of this, I was especially surprised to, to see Yes, a few weeks ago, some uh, words from Carapaz, pre precisely, he was saying, I don't know if it was kind of exaggerated by the media, but he was saying that 
in Movistar, you don't know when the knife is going to fall on you. Like, uh, like uh, saying that some, some days he felt like the team was uh, betraying him or, uh, or the, the confidence that, the confidence that uh, he believed that the team should have on him. That's absolutely no, not my impression by watching the race because I, I think Movistar no. was a, a team that worked really, really well around him. So uh, looks like uh, not a very elegant uh, yeah, I think that was said uh, maybe on. Uh, uh, yeah, that was maybe said on the interview on Netflix uh, series of uh, the movie star. I don't know. I think I heard that or read it or something. No, that wasn't the case in the Giro. That wasn't the case one hundred percent because um, I actually took uh, Richard as uh, you know. I mean, obviously, as you said, Landa was the leader. Um, Chente was uh, the first yes. I was the second yes. New guy in the team, so I took I took Richard as kind of not my guy but I kind of stayed with him in the bus during the meeting and I and I never personally I never really treated him as slapping him in an expected way you know I was always pretty honest and you know we made the tactics we went out for, for Landa and then slowly slowly as I just said and everybody saw he took he took that leadership role um Maybe he's referring of other stuff. Maybe he's referring of a year before or different races. But in the Giro, that didn't happen. I think everything, everybody was treated honestly, respectfully. And we, are, we had a good goal in our minds. Yeah. Okay, let's look a bit ahead now. Uh, we have a very strange season ahead of us. Uh, if everything goes well, it's going to be like quite a compressed uh, calendar. So... Well, how are you planning it? Uh, it's, uh, it's, I guess it's quite a challenge, no, not only for the riders, but for all the staff of the team to, to prepare a season like this. Are you finding it particularly difficult or is it going smoothly? No, it's going pretty smoothly. I think we're doing, uh, we're doing uh, our planning and uh, so far it's going smoothly. I, I think we just need to start, as in Strade Bianca, and get it going. And just see how the whole scenario reacts, you know, how is it going to be if, how the, you know, are we going to drop a little bit the guard and uh, are we going to be tested with a fever every day? I don't know what's going to really happen when we go to bike races, you know, I mean, the public is going to be around, not be around. I don't really know. Uh, I, I just know that it's going to be different, as you said. Uh, totally different. I mean, people in August, some people are slowing down. Some people are building up and you, know, you just have to go full gas into August and, and, and give it one of your best shots, you know, for the tour and, and for all the other classics. So it's something brand new. I haven't really, I think nobody's really ex ex experienced it, you know, going in so late to, for a grand tour, especially like, um, like the Vuelta. We'll, we'll see. I can't, what, what, what we expect, I don't really know. I, I think we just, everybody's really got the anger they they want to race they want to get going and, and we, I, I think we just have to start and see see what happens max i was going to ask you what to expect from from the dueto valverde mass but you already said that uh, we don't know what what can happen on, on the tour de france but i want to ask you your opinion because uh, last year we saw that the stress of three leaders in Movistar like Nairo, Valverde and Mikel in the Tour de France didn't work at all. Mm -hmm. Now it seems that the tide has changed and that the same troubles that you were facing uh, coming up to the, to the Tour de France last year are, have, have moved to Ineos uh, with Froome like saying that he's not comfortable anymore or just playing that he might leave. Um, Bernal saying that, of course, he's the number one on, on, the, on the team. And Thomas is like in the middle. <laughs> Thomas in the middle, of course. Um, do you think that they could face the same kind of troubles that, uh, that you guys faced uh, 12 months ago? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, for sure. When you, go, when you go with two leaders, it's, it's, it's good, but it's hard. And when you go with three leaders, it's, it's good. it could be very challenging, you know, so... You know, I just see Enos, uh, 
you know, when they do the, when they're doing their buying policy, you know, they, they, you go in a shop and you buy, it's just like, you know, they buy three iPhones and, and four tablets, you know, they just bought everybody and just bring them all in. You know, it's not a, it's not a structural vision of, uh, of things, you know, so, and they had people grow inside, you know, Gary Thomas grew inside the team and, and then eventually won a, won a Tour de France. So yeah, for sure. They can have to, they can have some hard uh, moments to, 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 you know, for these three guys. For sure, it's their problem, not, not our problem. <laughs> my, my last question, Max. Um, what is your impression, your overall impression, uh, after working uh, one and a half years now with Alejandro Valverde? Uh, it's just, uh, I really like Alejandro because... Uh, I always go back to one thing I saw last year, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just tell this little story, you know. So, uh, I was pretty nervous. My first race with Alejandro was, uh, was uh, um, about Strade, but then San Remo, you know. So, I'm here doing San Remo uh, the day before, going out for a little ride, and I had Alejandro, he's got the World Champion jersey, even on the training ride, and, and uh, they give him a new bike that morning, you know, to try out. So, he's got this brand new canyon with all the all the stripes on it and and then we do the little coffee stop on, on the on the pre-race San Remo day riding training ride and uh, we stop at uh, a coffee shop and uh, and he himself walks up to the team car what I just came out I was following them with and he goes in the back and he pulls out a little piece of cloth and he walks up to his bike and he starts cleaning the bike and I just said to myself I said it's fantastic you know a guy what's 39 years old, world champion jersey, and he's cleaning his bike with a cloth, you know, and he's looking at it, you know, and everybody's having a coffee and we're just chatting away and we had a photographer following us. And here is Alejandro cleaning the bike. And this is, this is what makes so, such a fantastic guy, the passion he has about it. And, and every day is, is like a new race, a new race to win, you know, a new, a new adventure, a new challenge. And this is, I think, Alejandro Valverde. So, and, and, and during this uh, lockdown, uh, I sent him a few messages and uh, I did a little video message and he sent me a video message back and I said, hey, I, said uh, I said, Alejandro, I really hope to win a race with you, you know, before you stop and or maybe I get kicked out of the team or whatever, who knows, but that is like, it will be really good to, to have a win together, you know, because I really respect him and I think he's a, he's a great value to the team. You said, you said yeah, that yeah, just, uh, just a, 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 few, a, a very small remark that I, I, I wanted to do, that he, he seems really, really easy to work with. It's the, the, the impression that we have from outside uh, Valverde, really an uh, easy person to work with. It, it goes back to what I said before. Uh, there's not much planning, you know, around Alejandro. You know, when you go to a bike race, where are the key points? You know, people know what to do. He knows what he needs to do, and it's and it just falls into place, you know. Without it's like it's like doing a puzzle what you've done already two or three times. You kind of pick up a piece and say, "This I know where it goes exactly." And Alejandro's one of them guys. Pretty simple, straightforward, easy guy to work with. You said that anecdote happened in in San Remo, and I think the speaking about the five monuments, the only one that's that's how out of reach for Alejandro for for a guy of his complexion is maybe Paris Paris Roubaix. But for the rest, do you think San Remo is maybe the closest to, to a guy nowadays, uh, 40 years old, like him? Yeah, I mean, San Remo's a race, what, uh, you know, depending a little bit on the wind and then the weather condition, because it's such a fast race. Uh, you know, you could do, a, like the old days, an attack on the Podro, and that's how fond it is. Burlan, a lot of guys won, you know, Kelly won. A lot of guys won on, on that attack, you know. So it's something that he can do, something that he can challenge, or something what he has to look at, and it's something that he has to try and win. Why not? For sure. That's pretty much it, Max. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, for the interview, and hopefully this has helped people understand a little bit what's your role in the team and how things work in Movistar, which seems a team as you have explained, quite different from, from others in the, their approach to races and also, also how they, they, they work from the inside. So, thank you. Grazie mille. And as you say in Italy, <laughs> in Boca Lupo. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Suerte. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And uh, whenever you guys need, I'm here.
with pleasure. I would like just, I just thought of one last question. Uh, Tell me. That Movistar documentary, you know, on social media, it became quite a trending topic on the cycling world. Those Megabon sauce things of uh, Chente. How do you swear on the, uh, on the microphone when you are in the race? In, in Italian, in English, what do you say? I, in Italian, cazzo, cazzo, cazzo. <laughs> in English, fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> that's what you say. Yeah, quite But, easy. Uh, easy yeah, to quite remember. Easy. I think that's uh, the tone of the voice. They understand it's a, it's a swearing moment, you know. So whatever language you swear, they understand it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks again. And, uh, okay, yeah, lovely. Go good, good to finish on a, on a funny note also. Good. Thank yeah. you, guys. Okay. Bye. Sí, see you. See you. Y bueno, ya sabéis, si os ha gustado el vídeo, pues como siempre, por favor, dadle a like, suscribíos para seguir recibiendo más contenido. Nosotros vamos a seguir al pie del cañón y vamos a seguir poniendo nuestro foco en todo lo que nos parezca interesante y que esperemos tam también nos lo parezca a vosotros. Nos vemos muy pronto. Chao.